This is the Same Jesus Podcast, a conversation between a pastor, a theologian, and their guests, exploring what it means to follow Jesus in the context of a movement known as the Foursquare Church. You're listening to Episode 5. All right, AJ, we are back. Welcome back. Welcome Fifth back. Fifth episode. And um, again, as a reminder to those who are tuning in, maybe you skipped the first four. Um, Shame on you. How could you not have listened to the first four? Yes. I really don't know what you're doing with your life. What would you do to skip the four and just go to the fifth? <laughs> yeah. Um, but we're having conversations to really aid uh, our our tribe, Foursquare. Uh, it's not just for Foursquare, but to Foursquare first. Leaders, pastors, yep. um, we're having conversations on topics that are important right now. Yep. They're important because everyone's talking about it, so we need to talk about it, or yep. they're important because no one's talking about yep. it. Yep. So we need to talk about it. Yep. And this one kind of feels like a mixture of the two, uh, this episode. Uh, we were going to talk about holiness. Mm-hmm. Holiness. Mm-hmm. Holiness is one of those concepts that is very biblical. I mean, Jesus tells his disciples in a Sermon on the Mount, be holy as I am holy. Mm-hmm. Now, that's interesting what that Greek word is, which we can get into. Um, I'm, I'm a millennial. You're Are you a millennial or are you Gen X? I'm a very old millennial. Old millennial. So you're like the cutoff Gen X yeah. millennial. Um, for me, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, my, my first experiences with the word holiness in the church Mm -hmm. were not positive ones. Mm -hmm. Holiness for me meant a certain moral snobbery. Is it okay Mm -hmm. to say snobbery? Mm -hmm. (laughs) A a moral superiority. Yes. A holier than thou. It was a moral prudishness, which always had a very comical turn. Like Mm -hmm. I remember, um, stories of being in the youth group of my church, First Baptist Church in Cary, North Carolina, Mm -hmm. and deacons, um, and and in that church at the time, alcohol was was not permitted, Mm -hmm. Um, but deacons going to restaurants and not knowing that members of the youth group were servers and ordering, uh, you know, coffee and Kahlua or something like that, you know, exactly. So there's a sense, it's sort of this double standard, this hypocrisy. So holiness was not uh, a positive force. It, I, 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 it wasn't talked positively to me. It, it felt hypocritical. It felt you put on a, a facade, but deep down there was no transformation. What were your earliest exp- experiences with the concept of holiness in the church? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, honestly, in the, in the first years that I became a Christian, I was 16 years old. Um, w- one of the first confrontations that I had in my new faith was, um, and I think this happens to a lot of people, um, is is immediately upon becoming a Christian, started going to church, started you know reading the Bible, going to Bible study, sharing my faith, was a confrontation with almost this sense of like um, all this stuff that had been dark that I had never talked about had mm. all like almost in a moment had come into the light. Yeah, and in a way, I remember there being an immense amount of guilt. Yeah, not like bad guilt, really, right. actually healthy guilt. Right. Like, like this, conviction. Yes, like yeah. this deep sense of like I was coming face to face with things previously. There was no friction in my life yeah. over, but now I was coming to terms with, oh, like I've been doing things my whole, you know, teen all my teenage years that are have been keeping me enslaved. Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a very liberating yeah. sense of conviction. But along the way, you, when you know when you um in your in your house, they uh you know the 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 gas that's in your uh, that you cook with that's in your in your stove they add uh, the negative smell to it because if you if you don't add the negative smell then uh, you can't smell the actual methane the, the gas it, it actually is, it doesn't have a smell so they have to add the negative smell to to make you realize that you're dying <laughs> you don't do your um it was almost like with the godly conviction came this really interesting. unhealthy interesting um this really unhealthy religious shame. Yeah. And the two, it's I, I've often found, even at 43, discerning the difference between those two is really hard. Yeah. My immediate feeling about holiness was there was so much good conviction, 
but very quickly some some deep church religious shaminess yeah. that was that that went with it that was not good because i feel like my generation and our generation we we swung so because holiness was that just what you're saying it sort of it had some good conviction we realized like isaiah you know in isaiah 6 in the throne room like you know Woe is Woe's me. I'm a man of unclean yeah. lips. Yeah. Like just in the presence of God, there's a yeah. sense of, oh my gosh, go away from me, Lord. So it was good, but then it sort of was met by human flesh, yes. flesh and, yeah. and, and hypocrisy yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Paul, and, yeah. Paul calls it the works of the law. Actually, right. this is, this is like one of Paul's biggest themes is that, um, is that we take on a duty bound action based understanding of holiness yeah. that is essentially about right. checking boxes right. Right. or something to that effect. But then my generation, we swung and I don't want to paint in too broad of, of strokes, but I feel like we swung to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. Mm. So mm. this sense of, Grace is uh, God's acceptance without our repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this mm -hmm. sense of um, we, we don't, uh, we, mm -hmm. we, because God just loves the world indiscriminately, we forget that it's through the death of the son, through the paying the price, and, and we don't have to do anything um, in terms of following him. Yeah. And that doesn't lead to healthy places either. Yeah. Uh, and I find in this moment of time that the conversation around holiness and consecration mm -hmm. is returning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exciting. I, hopefully it's, it's a balance, a return to a balanced understanding of holiness for, for ourselves, for our own lives, for our congregations. Yeah. Um, as you look at the scriptures, and especially between the Old Testament and the New Testament mm -hmm. understandings of holiness, what do you see? What what are what are differences between how the Old Testament understands what is holy and how the New Testament understands what is holy? Yeah, um, actually, a lot of a lot of what. So let's define our terms. So the Old Testament word for uh, holy is the word kadosh. It's this idea of um, something that um, is. It is not mundane. It is not everyday. It is something that is set apart for something unique and mm -hmm. different. The, the illustration that I like to use uh, is when my uh, my grandmother-in-law, so Quinn, my wife's mother, grandmother passed away, Gigi, we got all this china from her, this beautiful, awesome, just th these dishes that were just like, could you imagine taking the china and just like putting Big Macs on them or like, yeah. you know, microwaving mac and cheese, yeah. you know, with the china? <laughs> like you don't use that stuff for right. that. Right. The idea of kadosh is the Sabbath is the first thing that's called holy in the right. book of Genesis. Right. It's the the day that is holy, the day that is set aside. It is, it's the idea of something that is only for one specific purpose. Right. So what's interesting, your question about when I look at the Bible, is in the book of Isaiah. This is one of the most repeated phrases in the book of Isaiah is that God describes Himself as the Holy One of Israel. Mm -hmm. Here's what's interesting about that in Isaiah. Isaiah is critiquing Israel for their unholiness. Hmm. It's a sustained critique of uh, of Judah for their unfaithfulness to God. Yeah. Yet God calls himself the Holy One of Israel. Uh, people like John Golden Gay, who teach, te taught at Fuller Seminary, points out that God is seemingly willing to connect his own holiness with the unholiness of his people. Hmm. So he is he's describing himself as the holy one, but he is almost putting his holiness on the unholiness right. of the people. So holiness in that sense is God actually being willing to be found complicit right. with an unholy people. Wow. In the New Testament, Jesus is constantly willy-nilly running around with the unholy. Right. And and what is he doing? He is attributing he's He's almost lending his holiness to them. Right. It's it's an astounding concept yeah. that God would allow His holiness to be. Here's what I, here's what worries me. So I like what you just said. You said we are swinging a little bit more towards the like we need to. I would hope that we are longing to live lives that are set apart and different. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what often happens, and I found this. It's in Pentecostals and Charismatics. It happens a lot. Is that we we move towards a kind of rule-based holiness. Yeah. So for example, we see somebody who abuses alcohol yeah. and we go like, okay, so uh, somebody abuses alcohol, there's repercussions, people are hurt, um, somebody loses their job, a pastor you know, does something horrible. And then we start going, well, maybe we should just say that people shouldn't drink alcohol. Right. And we swing right. 
towards this rule-based approach towards holiness that leads to a whole other problem. Right. Where we are near God with our lips, but far in our hearts. Right. Which is ultimately what God is after with the concept of holiness. It's like the what you, whole person. The whole, that, that's the way I've always yes. heard it described. Holiness is spelt with a W. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole being. To be yep. holy is to be holy God. So the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, yes. mind, strength. Yep. Love God with your whole being. So holiness, it's not that it excludes our morality in the sense of how we live our lives and what we engage in. It's just, it's not reduced to that. Yeah, yeah. It's so much deeper than that. That is a part of it. It's not the whole the whole thing. You know, pastors, um, let me talk to pastors for just a second. Yeah. This addicts the, the reality of holiness. Um, I, t- I have for years taught um, preaching classes. In fact, I just finished teaching um, a preaching class at, uh, it was a preaching doctor minister class at Fuller Seminary. I often do, in this class, one of the one of the things I invite the students to do is to map out the days of the week when they experience their most uh, their most frustrating temptations, their mm-hmm. own personal like. If you could map out temptation in your week, actually, Catholics have a word for this. They call it the near occasion of sin. Hmm. It's the moments in the week when we are most susceptible to temptation, yeah. and almost universally, preachers and pastors will say that Sundays are their hardest day when it comes to temptation. I think there's a couple of reasons why. I think on one hand, when we're doing good work, yeah. we often put ourselves in a position of being uh, up for attack. Yeah. You know, we're, we're up for temptations right. and attack from the right. enemy. But I also think that ministry can tend to put in someone's mind the idea of, man, I'm working really hard for Jesus. Yeah. I, I deserve this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, man, Jesus, I'm laying my light down. Just give me just like a little bit. Just like a, I get just you know, a little past. You know what? Here. I realized this, that that this was not the case. I, uh, you know, we're commanded to put on the armor of God, right? Mm. And uh, I realized that um, that spiritual attacks would come to me and in, in, in my marriage and family on vacation. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And there's a sense of like, 100%. I was like, are you kidding me? Yes. Can I not just wear spiritual sweatpants on vacation? Yes. Can yes. I have one week Yes, that's off? the hardest time. And yeah. there's a sense of like, oh, yeah. no. Like, yeah. it's it's all, I'm either holy the Lord's or yeah. I'm not the Lord's. Yeah. Like, yeah. there isn't that. Yeah. 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 Holiness is actually, I think, very difficult often for people that are in the ministry to conceptualize. Right. Because there's this sense of entitlement, the yep. sense of like, I'm burning out for you, Jesus. So isn't it okay for me to just say a little bit, <laughs> you know, um, and there's elements of, of temptation that come from the enemy's, you know, work, works against us. For people who are in ministry, the, the theology of holiness um, is maybe the most important for, for those very reasons. Um, because it is so, isn't it not, it's so easy to, to perform holiness oh when my. the lights are on. Totally. I mean, that's what I saw in, in my Baptist church. Yeah, it, it's it's almost natural. It's Performative natural holiness. To us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you 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 exhibit it and on the on when when everybody's looking, but right. in the dark, my gosh, we're whole different people. What we need, Russell, is we need we need a movement of people that are committed to uh, holiness every part of the week, yeah. where we are formed by the Spirit of Jesus. I, I quoted this when I preached at Faith Center a couple, uh, not too long ago. And one of my favorite Dallas Willard's quotes, Dallas Willard quotes, is uh, his line where he says, There's no thing that reveals our formation in Jesus more than the spontaneous love of enemies. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the sense of we are so formed by the holiness and presence of God that we even react in holiness. Totally. We even react in holiness, right? Yeah. Like my knee-jerk, I want a knee-jerk reaction of holiness. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Pete Scazzaro, he has, I mean, his entire premise of emotionally healthy discipleship is off of being with God versus doing yes. for God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when those yeah. two get out of balance, uh, all sorts of, of sin creeps in. Yeah. And so what I think the Spirit is inviting us into is a a redefinition or maybe a correct definition mm. of mm. holiness. Mm. Holiness means that our lives would be holy unto the Lord, which is why rules-based holiness doesn't work. Because, I mean, Paul in yeah. Romans, he yeah. talks all the time about that, of like, uh, let us be led by love. But some people eat vegetables, some observe mm. days, you know, mm. like everyone by their own conviction, because whatever we do, do unto the Lord. We are the Lord's. We are holy the Lord's. So what would it look like for us in our private lives 
to have a being with Jesus, a being with God, that even outweighs our doing for God. Yeah, that's ultimately what he's getting at. Yep. Um, have you have we talked about? I don't think we have in first season. I don't think we did. Did we? Have we talked about a neuroscience attachment theory at all? I mean, we did, have talked about. It. I don't remember if it was first season. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Neuroscience. Uh, uh, everybody. Swiller did a lot of work with this. Yeah. Jim Wilder's done, yep. in which he's done some stuff with the our two movement. of them together. Yeah. Um, Kurt Thompson. Yeah. Who's a, neuro, a, a Christian neuroscientist uh, who does attachment theory stuff. Um. I think attachment theory is a really interesting way to think about this this conversation. Mm -hmm. We tend to be, we're face-to-face -face creatures. Humans are face-to-face -face creatures. We were made for faces. Mm -hmm. We were made to see a face. We were we were born, Kurt Thompson says in, in, in one of his books, he says that when a baby is born, they come into the world looking for someone that is looking for them. Yeah, a baby is looking a for a face, right? Yeah. A baby is looking for somebody that is looking back at them. Yeah. We were made for God's face. Yeah. What does Paul say? I behold God. I, I reflect the glory of God. Yeah. Right? We were made to behold God's face. And humans, when they don't have God's face to look at, tend to turn towards other things to Absolutely. give them their glory. Yep. You, that is a really fascinating way to think about addiction. Yeah. Because addiction, in, in, a, in a way, there's a lot of reasons why somebody experiences addiction, and we should not minimize it all because around the, this idea of attachment theory. But if we are not attached to the glory of God, mm -hmm. to the face of God, mm -hmm. we have to find our glory in something. Absolutely. We have to find our relief elsewhere, got, our, our, our validation. Netflix, our, yep, social media, our satisfaction, pornography, yep. a, a good food, right. our reputation, totally. our jobs, which are good things. When we are not holy the Lord's, when we are not so consumed, when we are not so attached yeah. to the presence of God that we are just absorbing God's presence, like yeah. a baby looking in the face of its mother yes. or, or father, yeah. then we will look into other faces and they will start to draw our hearts away and, yeah. and decay yeah. our souls. That's actually the whole storyline of the Bible is the <laughs> face of God. Because in the, in the Garden of Eden, humans had the face of God. They, they beheld God's face. The, immediately after the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3 and on, humans can no longer see God's face. In fact, in the Old Testament, when people see God's face, they die. They don't want to see God's face. And so in the Old Testament, when people see God's face, they die. Yet when Jesus comes, we behold God's face. And what happens? God dies. Jesus dies. Mm. And then Paul says, then, uh, this is in First uh, First Corinthians, um, then we will see him face to face. Yeah. Um, the idea is we're actually being restored to the face. Yeah. The whole story Christian journey is is our journeyness towards holiness is a restoration of our face-to-face -face relationship right, to right. God, um, which requires that we name our addictions, our right. patterns of evil that uh, of darkness that tend to rob us of, of that of that glory. So who are we talking to now? Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk with uh, with Jay Pathick, who's the president of the Vineyard Denomination. No way. And just has Love a it. remarkable story of coming to faith and and sort of putting into to contrast those two ideas of what is a holy life, what is mm. holiness, mm. what does addiction look like? And then Benji Horning, our San Diego four square friend, yep, yes. pastor of Light Church. Yeah, he's doing phenomenal um, work. And we're gonna talk about some of the spiritual disciplines because even what you're saying of what are the practices that help us behold the face of Jesus? What are the practices yeah. that allow us to be with God more than we do with God? Love it. Um, these are some of the practices that are becoming in vogue again. And I think rightly, you know, we're reading Dallas Willard a lot more. Yep. Uh, we're reading Richard Foster's The Spirit of the Disciplines or The Celebration of the Disciplines. Yep. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have a great conversation. Love it, let's get to it. All right, AJ, we are joined by our friends, Jay Pathick and Benji Horning. Jay is the president of Vineyard USA and Benji is a pastor in our Foursquare movement of Light Church in San Diego, California. Guys, thank you so much for taking time to, uh, so to talk to with us. So good to see you guys. Yeah. It's great to be here. Thanks My for great pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, um, we're gonna have a conversation on holiness, holiness and addictions, uh, and I think maybe to start, Jay, you go, and then Benji. Um, when you hear the word and the concept holiness, what images come to mind? What ideas come to mind for you, both from your past and maybe your current ministry? Yeah, I I think the the first images, if I'm just entirely honest are intensely negative <laughs> and sad and weird. Um, if I'm just really honest, yeah. like I wasn't raised in church. I don't have a church background. 
I had been around enough weird Christians to be suspicious of them. And so probably the, that stuff still gets stuck in me a little bit. The mm-hmm. thought that holiness mm-hmm. is people who are behaving weirdly, who think they're better than me uh, and others. Yeah. And are probably not very fun. Yeah. They're like <laughs> <laughs> stunningly boring people. Mm, mm. Um, but that that's probably not the right answer because I don't believe that to be true. But if you're just asking me what comes to my mind immediately, yeah. there's still some of that stuck in me because mm. a lot of the people mm. who like to talk about this stuff are not the kind of people I would want to hang yeah. out with. Yes. Um, <laughs> Holiness, the but. absence of fun. <laughs> I think C.S. Lewis <laughs> said something about that. <laughs> I mean, yes. I, I know there's a better, and, and uh-huh. I don't believe that's true for what it's worth. But, but I think then if I think about what I've come to believe is true, not just what was first off, is people that are set apart unto yeah. a joyful mm-hmm. and peace-filled yeah. life with God and others. That's good. Um, I do think that's what it means. Mm-hmm. They've been that have been set apart by God, not by their own volition or will, or their own goodness, but by the goodness of God yes. to yes. become a people yeah. who live differently. Yeah, beautiful. That's compelling. Benji, what about you? Um, to to be honest, it almost prompts a question um, when I hear holiness. Uh, my mind actually drifted towards God's nature. Mm more than ours and and in that sense um it it really conjures up uh a a pretty um expansive beautiful um just sense of who god is and in terms of how he's revealed in scripture that that there's something about his holiness that it's hard for any biblical author to be able to even describe accurately um and so holiness for me feels very much attached to that that part of who God is that's hard for us to grasp as humans, which mm-hmm. I think then parlays into our, um, when I think of it in terms of people, like holiness and people, it is, um, at, it's us probably fumbling towards this desire to be mm-hmm. like God, um, yeah. to be set apart and vibrant in that, um, that oftentimes uh, can get convoluted or look like not being fun or things <laughs> yes. like that. Uh, but it's more our attempt and, and less holiness, um, you know, as, as I think of it when it comes to my mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, Jay, you, I, I actually really gravitate towards your immediate gut level response uh, around holiness being uh, the, the absence of fun. I want to, I want to d- drill down on that for just a second and ask you both a, a, a question. Um, when you said that, I, oddly enough, I had this image in my mind of, uh, or I had the, I was reminded of the book of Leviticus, hmm. which is there's you know, zero fun in that book. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> well here, <laughs> take that back. I, I do. Take I that do. back. I do. Um, it it is it is the book that is about attaining holiness. The center of the book is atonement. It's about receiving God's holiness, and yet. One of the central features of the book of Leviticus is it's all about feasting and partying. It's yeah. about celebration. Right, right. So like the book that is about God's holiness is about throwing a good party. So let me, how important is it for Christians in, in, our, in, in our engagement with becoming holy people as God is holy? How important is fun and, and celebration? Like, do we need that? Does our soul need that? Is there a place for enjoyment in holiness? You're not actually asking, right? I am actually asking. Don't be. Oh, be, okay. be, Yeah, no. Don't be so evasive, Jay. Um, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I mean, like, like if isn't isn't doesn't the Bible actually invite us to like a kind of holiness that's actually really human? Well, if it doesn't, then I don't know what it's doing. I mean, yeah. So, yes, that's why I was joking. I mean, obviously. I mean, and yet somehow, I mean, again, even the way you describe Leviticus and the way that it's understood is as though we're being set apart for what? 
just mm. so that we can be um, Ro- robots better than others right. or right. somehow non-celebratory. But yeah, I mean, I, I've been really impacted by so much of the different teaching, even some of the neuroscience on how peace and joy are really experienced in our bodies and our lives mm. and our relationships. Um, I, I, I think we're set apart to live lives, lives of peace, mm. real peace, where though the world around us might be disordered, we are a non-anxious presence mm. Mm. that can live in joy with God and with people, yes. that God is fully content and full of joy. And yet we're in the middle of this messed up place where all kinds of things are broken around us and within us. And so, you know, I, I'm of the of the inclination, which I think I can tell you are as well, that through even the Hebrew scriptures, the different commandments and challenges are so that we can be rightly ordered yeah. mm-hmm. with God right, and with right, one right. another, yes. set apart unto this place of joy and peace. And so for me, yeah, I, I think when people don't enjoy their lives and somehow they think they're living some kind of life with Jesus— yeah. Uh, it's really problematic. That doesn't mean there isn't suffering. Right. It doesn't mean things aren't hard. It doesn't mean things aren't a mess mm-hmm. around us. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that we should experience something that looks like peace and joy in the midst of those things. Yeah. I think the New Testament underscores that over and over again. And so, yeah, I do think that that is a fair litmus of how much grace are we living in? Mm-hmm. Are we able to enjoy ourselves? And frankly, it might even include not taking ourselves as seriously yeah. mm. as we might be mm. tempted. Yes. Uh, the, we make much of God by making less of ourselves mm. um, because he's done the work. Yeah. Yes. yes. And and so, Benji, here's a question for how you pastor people. We talked about earlier before you guys came on, similar to what you know we've said of some of our experiences with holiness, at least at first, were particularly perhaps negative. Negative, yeah. Yeah, negative in nature. Uh, a moral snobbery, a uh, holier than thou. And yet what we're all saying is like true biblical holiness, the true nature of God, this, the, the drenched in the presence of God could be the most raucously good time mm. that any of us mm-hmm. have experienced. But there's a disconnect. How do we begin, Benji, you answer first. How do we begin pastoring people across that bridge? What does it look like to jettison those wrong and harmful notions of of holiness and recapture the beautiful one mm-hmm. offered in scripture. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. You know, we um, our context is our our town we pastor and even the congregation we pastor largely is coming out of um, like a non Christian background, um, but one that has um, a lot of access to good things, pleasurable mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of our conversation on holiness doesn't actually begins with appetites. Yeah. It begins with this mm. desire of like, what do you, mm. what are you chasing? And mm. then, uh, and when they describe those things, and I'm speaking about people who like wouldn't go to church or things like that. It's actually saying, I, I think that God joins you in that desire for you to have that thing, but he wants to give it to you in such a way that will not extract life from you or take yeah, life from you, but will ultimately good. sustain you. That's really good. And I think that's actually the power and one one of the reasons we promote like a um like a practice of fasting in our church yeah. is it's actually getting in touch with your hungers and your drives. Not to say that they're bad, but to say that what you are doing to fulfill those drives ultimately will leave you hungry again. And Jesus' bold claim is that life with him is with the ultimate satisfaction of those things yeah. which i think ultimately is this thing that holy living is this desire to be attuned to your appetites your drives for pleasure for fun for joy um and then to ultimately say i'm not going to settle for a counterfeit i'm not going to bypass it to get a cheaper version of it that will ultimately rob me of that but i believe that jesus is going to be able to provide that in its fullness yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and so I think, mm-hmm. I, you know, and, and I, and I find it, I find that people are, are searching more and more for someone to give them a map towards holiness. Yeah. Um, I think that there is this ambiguity we have in our culture in terms of like, what is right living? 
And, um, and so it's interesting. Like, I find a lot of young people asking for and looking for something that invites them into a life that isn't uh, fast and cheap and things like that, but it's something that's rich and sustaining. And um, so I, I, I find that there's actually a growing hunger for that because, again, our, our desire to be a holy people is attaching to how we were designed and created by God, right. which will ultimately right. give us joy, will ultimately give us abundance of life. Right. Mm. Yeah. It, it makes me think of uh, G.K. Chesterton has um, a little bit in his book, Heretics. I don't know if you guys have read that, where he talks about alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he says there's two types of drinking. There's rational and irrational drinking. Hmm. And he says Christians should be irrational drinkers. Hmm. And what he means by that is rational drinking is drinking because you need it, because life is hard, because uh, <laughs> you need like the substance to, to help you yes. avoid yeah. pain. Irrational drinking is because you do not need it because mm. it's drinking with mm -hmm. celebration. Now, I, where I'm not advocating, you know, yes. there's different approaches with alcohol. And so, yeah. but I, it gets to that idea of like, we are so ordered. The holy life is that we are so satisfied. Our, our loves, our desires, you just wrote a book on desire. Mm -hmm. Our desires are so satisfied in Christ that it allows us to appropriate uh, the good things of creation mm. and then, and that, a posture of abundance. Yeah, I'd actually like to get really practical with the two of you while while we have you. Um, this is an of actually of all the episodes that we're doing this 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 season. This one to me, the, you, we're bringing together holiness and addiction. Yeah. And the, you, in I think in the normal scheme of things, you go like, how, what do those have to do with each other in any way, shape, or form? Um, I remember a therapist saying to me once, it was actually my therapist who told me that there's an intimate relationship between addiction and deprivation. And, and what, what he was trying to get me to see is that often we wrestle with our deepest addictions in the places where we have been most deprived. So like when we've withheld being loved by somebody or being touched in a nurturing way if we need it, that that actually drives us to compulsive and addictive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Would the two of you talk to us a little bit? You know, you got a bunch of pastors and leaders. Talk to us about how often, do, do you see a connection between our addictions and our lack of des our lack of satisfaction in God. Yeah. Like, do you see a connection between those two? Is it, do we sometimes find ourselves in addictive patterns because actually we're not enjoying yeah. the life God has given to us? You know, I, I think that's a great connection. Um, Robert Mulholland has a book, Invitation to a Journey. Oh, such a good where book. Where he, such a good book. And he, he kind of lays out all of these different spiritual disciplines and practices but he talks about how you need like upstream and downstream disciplines. You need the mm -hmm. ones that go along with your personality that are easy and enjoyable. For me, that's feasting. I'm really good at that. But then you need the downstream disciplines, which are fasting. Yeah. But he says that's different for each personality type. But he specifically talks about if not only if you don't find satisfaction in the Lord, but if you are not actively disciplining those areas of your life that are hard for you, yeah. that those yeah. areas you will go and find something else because yeah. they weren't intentionally being developed and worked through the Lord. And so I, I do think that there's um, ultimately, yes, like, I mean, Jesus, it's why so many of the analogies he uses is things like bread and water. Yes. Right. Uh, why is he's like, these are things you crave. I am those things at the very same time. It's also, he gives us opportunities to, pay attention to the things where that are not right. easy for us. And, and yeah, Maholan does a great job talking about like, know your wiring, your mind is a big type, all these things and, and then add disciplines into your life that help shape and mature your shadow side. Mm. Beginning just talks about leaders that have those shadow sides that were underdeveloped and under matured. Yeah. And they ended up having those areas be areas where they fell because it was, it was completely, you know, lack, mm. kind of lack of mm. development in it. Yeah, Jay, I'd love to hear your response too. Do you see a connection between addictive patterns and you know our relationship with God? What do you what do you see in the connection between those two? Uh, I think it takes. Uh, it's interesting that it was a therapist that drew that to your attention. It, it, it takes a certain kind of safe and courageous space to even yeah. begin to evaluate those things within yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a theory of addiction that tells you that you're trying to manage some kind of pain with addiction, mm. which I think is probably true. But there's also another way of thinking about addiction, which is more in line with what you're saying, which is that you're taking on illicit means to meet needs 
that need to be met. Ah, in other ways. interesting. Yeah. So if you imagine like a, you know, we'll we'll do a training with folks in our churches where if you imagine a column of all the things that you should need, like safety, intimacy, purpose, meaning. Mm-hmm. Nearly always, addictive processes are connected to those things. Mm-hmm. So let's say. Uh, pornography use. You know, let's just jump in the deep end. Uh, So pornography is usually connected to some kind of need. I need a sense of intimacy or safety. So uh, that helps me feel that. And so here we come as a well-meaning pastor and we say, you should definitely stop looking at porn. And they're like, I knew it. I knew it was bad. And what the experience of the person, though, is, is what we're, what the experience is us saying, you don't actually need intimacy. Yeah. Mm. You don't actually oh, need safety. Yeah. Huh. So those things get stapled together. And so when we say, stop this thing, they go, fine, I'm happy to do that. And what we do is we start then on a, on a deprivation cycle. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so now they're going to try to figure out how to live without a sense of safety and connectedness yeah. or intimacy. Yeah. And all we're doing when we do that is we're creating a cycle by which then they're going to have to binge. Yep. Yes. Somehow they're going to have to binge. So what do we do? Well-meaning pastors, if on the other side of the column is disciplines, okay, now I want you to get intimacy through prayer, let's yeah. say. And people are like, great, I'm in. Well, here's the thing. Uh, when you don't know how to pray and you learn to pray, it is not nearly as great as looking at porn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just straight yep. up. It's just not. Yep. So you're like, okay, so I'm not looking at porn now. I'm praying. Hey, pastor, this isn't working. Well, here's the problem. The the economy of Satan, or I think evil, is you get a quick hit with no effort. Yeah. Yes, yes. But over time, you have to apply more effort and you get less of a hit. Mm. The same is true inversely, yeah. I think, with discipline. So true. Yeah. You get a low hit with a lot of effort. Okay. Yeah. So like it's not going great. Like I'm praying and it's freaking miserable. Yeah, totally. Like I don't even know what I'm doing. But I think we have to give people realistic and by the way, I'm saying this is like a full blown, like lunatic charismatic. Yeah. We have to give people like realistic frameworks where we say, but over time yeah. your intimacy with God can grow to where it's less effort where there's a a bigger yield, but it's going to take time. Yes, yes. Like that first small group you go to when you're used to just drinking with your buddies on a Friday night, it isn't that It's great. not going to be fun yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. not. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. But it's okay. Over time, I mean, I remember when I first came to Christ, you know, I'm in a vineyard guy, so people love worship. And I would just skip the worship <laughs> yeah. time because I couldn't uh, tell what was going on. Uh, people were singing, they're crying and stuff. I played sports. Like, I don't want to sing yes. ever if I can avoid it. And I'll never forget a guy caught me coming in. He said, Jay, I see you come late every time. And I said, I do. He goes, I go, I don't get the singing part. It's just so much freaking singing. And he looked at me, and I think he prophesied to me. He said, Jay, listen, if you can learn how to grow your appetite mm, and yeah. learn how to receive from God and worship, I'm telling you, there's a day not long from this one that this will be like bread and life to you. Yeah. 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 Wow. And I remember staring at him thinking, nah. But I'll tell you what, all these years later, yeah. he's 110% right. Yeah. right. And it's important we just tell people there is a process in this thing. There is a sense of loss when you move away from things that destroy you. And there is a sense of awkwardness when you're learning a new way. But over time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then then the payback is limitless. Like, I have friendships that I never imagined possible. I, I have a marriage I never thought anyone could have, let alone me. Yeah. Um, I have a prayer life, like a real one, that I, I mean, at the risk of sounding super spiritual, I wake up in the morning, this, this part could tear me up, looking forward to being with the Lord yeah. for mm-hmm. real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, not in a made-up way. Yeah. And I never would have imagined that was possible. Yeah. And it's not just possible. And it makes me wonder what's what's ahead of me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What, what else could come? Yeah. I remember, you, this is so funny. I remember this m- memory in college. I was a freshman in college. And I had a friend named Milo Skinner 
who told me, I remember I asked him, do you drink Coke? Do you drink soda? And he said, I don't drink soda. And I said, why? And he said, because water's so good. And at that time, I drank soda all the time. And I was like, was he are you serious? He was, was he dead joking? serious. He's oh, like, I don't, I don't drink soda because water's awesome. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's not. Yeah. It's garbage. I hate water. Yeah. And I, I remember <laughs> I, ha- he, I, I asked him, like, how'd you do it? And he said, well, just you have to stop drinking soda and only drink water. And your tastes will change. Yeah. And I remember at first, water was gross. But now it's like, I, I don't drink soda. I could not imagine going back to Coke now that I know how great soda is. How, how do, I mean, gosh, how does God actually change our, our, our tastes for what we long for? How does God change our desires? I mean, talk, talk to us a little bit about the process by which we can actually get to a place where we long to get up in the morning and just enjoy God. Yeah, how do we create the How endurance? do we create that? Yeah. How do we create well, that hunger, that thirst? I'm with Benji. I'm, I mean, for me, for Americans specifically, I don't know a way forward for spiritual health and growth without fasting and solitude. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, we are so full. And we don't even know what we want. We're too busy just consuming. And, I mean, if you try to get people quiet for like 30 minutes and keep teaching them practices of stillness and meditating on the goodness of God, Mm. the weird stuff that flies out of people. And by the way, I'm talking about pastors (laughs) right now. I'm not not just talking about like... (laughs) I'm talking about like professional Christians, right? Like... You can't often get them quiet enough Hmm. to notice even the own movements of their own Mm -hmm. soul or mind. And then if you get them to fast while they're in solitude, the kind of appetites that scream at them and then eventually abate, but then new ones that wake up. I don't know a way to disciple people in the United States without those two primary disciplines, in my opinion. I think you wake up in a different way. Mm. Benji, you have any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, you know, I think, you know, Jay, you know, you're like a vineyard guy and knowing this podcast is mainly going to like a four square community as well. I think that there, one of the things I love about being a part of a Pentecostal and charismatic movement is this high expectation for God to do something instantaneously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you're talking about holiness or addiction, and the and the relationship between the two, um, this is this is something that God can do and has done. Mm-hmm. My my grandpa got healed instantaneously when he got saved at Billy Graham Crusade. It can happen at the same time. Wow! Uh, there is there needs to be conversations around the long process of what God is doing and forming you into in terms of Christ's image. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The, especially when you're talking about addictions. And I, one thing I would just say too is like addiction is kind of an interesting word because some of those things need different types of help. And so mm-hmm. part of being a pastor mm-hmm. is yeah. having the discernment in terms of what are you dealing with with people? Like is this is this solved through spiritual disciplines and things like yeah. this? Are there other things that can come right. and partner with like right. the word of God? And I think you need to have the maturity to, to know in those situations with things like that. But, but I love, I mean, honestly, Jay, everything you're saying, I think is just, just really, just really, really good because I, I, I think, yeah, I think if we can also recognize the time and space that we, we are in, like we are pastoring, a very exhausted people. Yeah. And um, and I think about like AA, right? Like the most famous group that helps you out of addictions just talks about halt. Yeah. Like if you're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, yeah. uh, you need to like call someone because that's when addiction kicks in. Yeah. And I think that if I look at those four words, like hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, I think that describes a lot of what our culture feels all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think the wisdom of of living a life of holiness and rhythms and patterns of holiness is to make sure that you are aware of those things. Like yeah. where are your hungers and your appetites? What, you know, what's the desolation and the frustration you feel? Where are you lonely? You know, where are you tired? And instituting things like Sabbath and rest. I mean, it's 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 brilliant. Like that Jesus not only gave us 
the cross and the resurrection. He gave us his whole life. Yes, Say, watch yes. how I lived. And that's all spiritual disciplines are, right? It's just looking at the model that Jesus gave on what it means to be human, adopting those same rhythms into our own life because we trust that he teaches us how to be human. Yes. And ultimately, a holy life is a life that looks like Jesus, yeah. which is a full life. My yep. gosh, right? Like, But it's it's not hurried it's not stressed it's it it looks very different than what is prescribed to us in our culture yeah. and yeah. when i when i think of holiness at its best it's not like moralistic and ethical ascent yeah. i think it's creating yeah. rhythms in your life that open yourself up to the love of god because yeah. i think ultimately at the bottom of every single addiction and wrong drive is we are looking yeah. for what love can ultimately provide for us yeah. mm -hmm. and spiritual disciplines at their best open us up to perfect love yeah. um, they don't earn it right but they open us up to the reality that it is present and that we can then interact with that perfect love so that because we cannot love isn't like information we can gain and then go teach someone love has to ultimately be received and so if we are blocked in our ability to receive god's love as pastors mm -hmm. Um, we're going to have a hard time training people to be recipients of his love and ultimately living lives of wholeness and love as well. That so good. I So practically for the pastors who are listening in, we've said such good stuff around safe and courageous spaces, around being able to receive love. How would you pastor the pastors who are listening right now? How would you speak wisdom to the pastors of creating safe and courageous spaces where they can begin to acknowledge their own addictions, begin to come face to face with the deprivations in their own soul that they are filling with all sorts of things and um, choose an alternative pathway of formation of life with Jesus. What would that process even question. look like for our pastors practically? Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> oh, me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I agree with Benji. I, I think, um, I think honestly, talking about Sabbath as real practice of life yeah. mm -hmm. um, is essential. Yeah. Um, I think for those who are married, having some way that your marriage gets under the microscope with somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, is essential. I think outside of or within Sabbath practices, something, some patterns of solitude um, and fasting. Yeah. And then I don't know how else to say it, but I, the, the number one question I ask pastors when I'm with them is, what do you love doing? What do you enjoy doing? Mm. And how much of that are you doing? And so do you actually have anything that is just fun like yeah. you just enjoy doing with your spouse and and that could be reading a book that can be i like to hike and i don't know this this sounds a little simple but i basically think people have to move their bodies mm -hmm. so what are you doing with your body that makes it move yeah. um as much as you're able you don't have to be some crossfitter or you know ultra marathon runner but like you've been given your body yeah. like you should do something I, and i'm not saying you have to do cold plunges and essential oils uh that's a denver thing <laughs> where i am but but like just just anything yeah. and i find that when people move their bodies they're taking their marriages seriously they're thinking about their kids life with their kids they have sabbath they have some practices of solitude by and large, a lot of other things work. Yeah, that's good. Um, if they don't have those things, we're just waiting for something to go wrong. Yeah. Mm. What about cold plunges in essential oil? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm sure somebody's doing it. Let me friends. just put it that way. Okay. Somebody's doing it right That's now. It's a lot of myrrh and it's frankincense right there. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot yeah. of patchouli. Yeah. 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 You know, I I think when you ask that question, and I'm thinking about pastors, mm -hmm. um, um, I had a I had a pretty rough uh, fall, mm -hmm. uh, like autumn, and I think that uh, it was it was so rough because I don't think I was aware that my 
good desire for the mission of God became probably an unhealthy, I would even maybe call mm. it an addiction. Yes. Mm. And an addiction means that you have taken something that would give you joy or dopamine and you have prioritized it over relationships, you yes, prioritize yeah. it over health, you, yeah. you know, you, and I think we're pastors and obviously there's this stuff we know we shouldn't do, like we should not be sinning and we need to like make sure we're aware of those things. But I think sometimes holiness, if we're to live like Jesus, is to not, is to not turn the need, the crisis, and even the mission into an idol to be worshipped. Yeah. So good. And and I think a brutal lesson I've had to walk through the past few months yeah. is is recognizing that God has. Um, gosh, I had a mentor of me uh, share with this thing. It's Daryl Johnson. He said, "So the strange thing about pastoring is you are participating in something you don't carry." Mm-hmm. And I think that's the tension is mm-hmm. sometimes our mm-hmm. participation with the mission of God translates us into feeling we have to carry it. Right. And all of a sudden that we, we do, we start not paying attention to just the check engine lights in our body and in our emotional right. and mental health. And, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden things that we're doing, I mean, like it's literally the Martha Mary thing, like the thing we're doing that's so good. We're serving Jesus. We're so about it. It gets yeah. us so blinded that Jesus actually has to interrupt us to say, you're, you're, you're so distracted. Yeah. By all of yeah. these things, which, by the way, are good. Yeah, You've totally. forgotten the one thing that's needed. Yeah. And I think that, like, that's what my heart goes to. If, if pastors are listening to this, um, God's desire, deep desire for you is to be faithful to his spirit. That's why Paul says in Galatians, keep in step with my spirit. Yeah. And don't, don't bypass him. Don't run out faster than that. Um, and, and rather than just keep in step with him. And oftentimes that will go slower than you'd like your congregation yeah. and yep. your mission yep. and your project will move slower than you'd like, but your soul will not pay the penalty for it. Yeah. And so I think that would be the addiction. I would encourage pastors to pay attention to, um, is, is really the, the drive of, of the mission that is what got us into this, um, needs to be in its healthy place. Yeah, I, I want you know we we, we um. Th- by the way, thank you for this rich yeah, conversation. Guys, the two really of you good. have offered us so much. Um, it dawns on me in conclusion to this interview that in movements like our own that can tend to be kind of holiness in nature. I mean, we literally come yeah. from the holiness Burst tradition. Yeah. Um, yeah, is that we can be environments that do tend towards inviting people to a kind of performative spirituality yep. where we almost feel this pressure to per- perform. perform. Yeah. And, and the reality is that that can create, maybe that's a shadow side for our movement, yeah. is that we have a kind of spirituality that can often look really great when the lights are on. Yeah. Um, but I think this conversation invites pastors to attend to the truth of their soul, what's actually going on inside, and not be ashamed of treating that part of their life as important, if not more important, yeah. than when the lights are on. Gosh, because if our faith is just only good when we have the mic in our hands, that's a depressing form yeah, of spiritual. Dangerous, da- dangerous um, too. Dangerous, yeah. yeah. So thank you for inviting us into the deeper dimensions of wholeness. The two of you are a gift. And on behalf of yeah, the people that are listening, thank you for offering this to our to our movement. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for having us. I can tell you, My essential pleasure. oil sales after this episode <laughs> are skyrocketing. You can Brought just hear it. Yeah. By, by our vineyard. Sponsors. Our sponsors, Vineyard, <laughs> brings you essential yeah. oils. Yes. Vineyard Gold uh, the Wim, We call it the Wimber brand. That's what we call it. Yeah, the, there it is. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Guys, thank you so much for your time. AJ, we've covered a lot of terrain in this conversation. We've talked about um, Kurt Thompson coming into the world, looking for someone, looking for us. Mm-hmm. We've talked about God um, as love, as attachment love. Mm-hmm. Um, and that conversation right there, with uh, Jay and Benji was just rich with this sense of uh, what are the ways that we have these deep relational deprivations Mm -hmm. um, that are meant to be filled by God Mm -hmm. uh, that we're looking at other places that can become addictive in nature. I remember when I first started practicing silence and this is, you know, I want to speak from my heart to the pastors listening. When I first started practicing silence, I hated it. I hated it. There was so much grief anger in my heart. There were so many 
unprocessed wounds in my soul. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was interesting because at that time, I was probably more addicted to dopamine than ever in my life. Hmm. It reminds me of a passage in Ephesians 4 that talks about how um, uh, the Gentiles, those who are not in Christ, that their hearts were calloused, and therefore they were greedy for sensuality and every kind of impurity. And that's so opposite from the narrative we hear in society. Society would say the more sensual we are, the more uh, free we are, the more we give ourselves over to experiences and, um, and, and, and the things that the world has to offer. That's actually a sign of our health. That's a sign of our, our, our heart's health. And actually I think the scripture would say that's a sign of our heart's callousness. There's a hardness there. It's your example of, um, you don't need Coke, um, when there's when you realize like the depths and the goodness of water, yep. and I think where I want to end this conversation because for pastors who are like thinking, how do I do this? How do I begin? It will be difficult at first to remove yourself to remove yeah. yes those things to enter into the silence, the stillness, to enter into a slow down, um, just turning your soul to the presence of God. Yeah. But in time, you will begin to experience how delicious water and yeah. bread yeah. is again. Yep. 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 You have any final words? No, I mean, yeah, t- I, I think that's an, a, a, a wonderful way to end. And, you know, whenever we, uh, whenever we stop tasting the artificial, when we stop drinking salt water, you know, what do they say? When you're, when, if somebody's lost at sea, you're so thirsty if you yeah. don't have water that you would be willing to drink salt water yeah. which in the end would end up killing you yeah and i think i think we all live our lives drinking salt water our life is one big big gulp of salt water after another and you know the process of 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 stopping that is simultaneously allowing our souls back to life but it does but it takes time it takes time energy takes time. and a lot of patience and and a lot of grace because grace. there are going to be moments the same word yeah like yeah. like we it, it, a lot of grace t- that in those moments we do go back to drinking the salt water to being like, you know, there's reasons I do this. Um, I'll I'll close with this. I had, I referenced my therapist um, in, in our interview and the very first, one of the first times I met him when we would meet and we would talk about really difficult things, he would, he would point to me and he would say, do you notice what you're doing? And I I was always touching my arm Hmm. like this. And he would say, do you notice that you do that? And I said, I never noticed that I do this. And he said that that you know what you're doing, you're comforting yourself, you're soothing yourself, yeah. because and and what what it, I, that's what I've done my whole life is yeah. soothing myself. Yeah. And um, what I actually need is not more self care. I actually need to receive other people's care. Yeah. There's a form of self care that's actually really dangerous yeah. that we do because we haven't been attached to and cared for in the ways that we needed yeah. um, to. But I think a lot of grace because we have all got reasons and rationale for why we have addictive patterns being graceful for ourselves because Lord knows Jesus has profound grace on us and we tend to have less grace on ourselves oddly than Jesus does. And I think that's, that should be the final word in a conversation on holiness and addiction. Um, It is the grace of Jesus. Yeah. It is the blood of Jesus that covers the earth. Yep. And that is where we rest all of our hope, all of our trust. Uh, We continue to return to his grace for us and get back up the next day. Yep. Good word, brother. Thank you for listening to the Same Jesus Podcast. On our next episode, Russell and AJ discuss the future of the church in America.